Howdy folks, this is the Command Line Volpine here, and welcome to my tutorial series for Door Fortress on the Steam Edition this time. This series will be in a sort of a Let's Play format, where it'll be a tutorial, but we'll be playing through the game in its entirety, basically. Uh, alongside these videos, I will use the footage from these in order to make shorter videos that you can also watch on the channel, where we cover very specific things in a more concise manner. But for this one, let's first start with settings. I wouldn't recommend changing both settings, but you can always change your resolution here and switch between full screen and windowed. One thing for people who do stream themselves or record themselves, uh, full screen is not working with game capture right now. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case forever, so uh, I have it in windowed so I can record from the window because I don't want to do a display capture. In audio, I would recommend lowering some of these volume sliders. It's a bit too loud at the start, so I've lowered music volume, I've lowered the master volume and lower the ambience volume just a bit, just so you guys can hear me talk. You might even still sometimes hear the sound be too loud over my voice, but one of those things. Now the game section is where I might see, where I might recommend the most changes. So I would increase your auto save frequency to seasonal. I believe it starts with semi-annual at the start. Of course, there's four seasons in a year, four auto saves a year, it's not that bad. So seasonal problems can pop up where you need to reload the game. So seasonal is definitely a good idea. Also do auto save after the embark. That's just as soon as you start the game, it'll save. Uh, pause after every auto save. Pretty self-explanatory. Just pause the game after it auto saves. Just a handy thing to have because sometimes things will happen at the very start of a season as soon as it rolls over. And then you want to be able to answer to that quickly. So that's why I would always pause it. Pause after loading. Same thing. You don't want to necessarily go into a situation that's hot <laughs> uh, unpaused, you know. A lot of these other ones I'd leave the way they are. One thing to note though, is the keyboard, keyboard cursor enabled. This returns the game to its classic state for how you like select things. And I'm not gonna get too in depth with it here, but it's like if you hold down shift and the arrow key, you make like a, you make a larger selection on the screen. And, but it, uh, you still have the mouse available, but the downside of turning this on is you no longer, when you're selecting with your mouse, you don't get a box selection anymore if you turn this on. So it's kind of it's kind of a give and take. If you're really used to the way the game was in the past, you probably want to turn this on to yes. If you're playing the game for the first time, or you're ready to learn how to play with the mouse, you probably want to leave that on no, because there is there is advantages and disadvantages to both. Down here is a bunch of the minimum. Down here is a bunch of the minimum and maximum values that things can have. Again, this is one I would not mess with too much. Um, embark width and height. You can change this in the selection screen. I think when you're picking a start. Actually, you might not be able to. It might say stuck on four. So if your computer's a little slow, maybe you're running on a little laptop or something, you might want to bring this down to three instead of four because it'll still have plenty of space. I wouldn't really recommend going up to five, and I really wouldn't recommend going down to two because then you're starting. This is your starting area. That'll make it too small to play in, really, if it's two, or it'll be too big if it's five. Some of the other ones to consider changing. Again, if your system is slow, I would recommend these. It is lowering the population caps. Um, there's the regular population cap, and then there's one that also includes like new babies being born, which is a more hard cap. This will make it so definitely you can't go over 220, where this is a little lighter. But yeah, same for all these. Just lower them a bit if uh, you're rolling a low wind system. I am not, so we should be fine. There's also some FPS settings down here. I wouldn't mess with them. The game runs at a default of 50 FPS, which I know is very a very strange number, but... I assume that it's like that for a reason, so I don't mess with it. One thing you might want to turn on, though, is show numeric liquid values. This will just show you how deep water is instead of it just being a water texture. And you can also change all the keybinds for the game if you so desire. I'm not going to mess with them. You can change them back to the way they were in the classic game, but I would do that at your own peril because they've probably been changed for a reason. I don't expect they would have changed them if there wasn't a reason to change them. So, with the settings out of the way, let's go into the main game. I have a continue active game here because we did a stream a while back. Uh, let's go ahead and create a new world, though. So we can talk about creating a new world. Welcome to Dwarf Fortress. Prepare to guide your stout charges to fortune in a world fraught with many perils. You'll begin by creating your world, watching the region's history unfold. Once this process is complete, you can prepare a group and send them out to seek wealth deep within the mountains. As you dig deeper and your citizens take up residence in your outpost, your doings will attract attention, both wanted and unwanted. Deal with challenges as they arise, and one day you might find that your humble settlement has grown to become a mountain home, the center of your civilization. Okay, so most of these settings we're not going to change. Uh, some of the things to think about, again, if you have a weaker computer, you might want to switch it down to a small. 
If you have a pretty good computer, you might be fine with a large world. We're going to leave it on medium. History length. Um, they've made improvements to how fast history gets rendered in this game. And Dwarf Fortress, <laughs> in case you haven't heard, it's incredibly detailed and incredibly in-depth. So like every single person that lives gets their life actually simulated in the game. No joke. That actually happens. It's, uh, it's a little insane. But what happens is as the year length gets longer here in this selection of when you want the start date to be, there's so many people that it really starts to slow down the game. So again, if your computer is older, you definitely don't want to increase these. Um, if you have a newer computer, you could crank them up, but there's also other issues because as time goes on, there's more people, they populate the world more, and then there's less embark locations. And then apparently there's also uh, legendary monsters that are spawned at the very start of time. Those will die over time. And instead, what you'll end up facing more of is things like werewolves and vampires as you increase the history length. And werewolves and vampires and stuff are actually pretty annoying in this game. <laughs> it's very hard to deal with. I'd rather fight legendary creatures, to be honest with you. The rest of these um, beasts and savagery you could turn down if the areas are be areas being generated are too difficult. Civilizations and sites, I'd probably leave those the way they are. And mineral occurrence, I think in classic is set to just frequent. And then steam is on everywhere. This is just how common minerals are to find, which can make things easier. So we'll leave it on everywhere. It's also a detailed mode, but it's like super detailed. Like you have to actually know like <laughs> what all the numbers mean and how to change them. We are not going to mess with that. I've never messed with it. I don't know how to do it. So let's create a world. Now creating a world can take time. It's what much faster in the steam version than it used to be. But uh, again, if you have an older computer, it's going to take longer. That's why you might want to change the uh, the time scale and everything. As you can see, mine's ripping through it pretty quick. It's also showing you some of the major events that have happened. And we're already to year 100. I could probably set for my computer like 250. The uh, I think that was the long length, wasn't it? Also, a medium world might be smaller in here than it was in the original one. I'm not exactly 100% sure, but let's click play. This is our world, Roth Nasil, the domain of forever. Then it also has to save the world. There's a lot of steps in this process. All right, now we can select our game type. Fortress is the base game. Adventure is not here, but adventure mode is like a, it's like a single player game. It turns into more of an RPG, but it still uses like the same tile set and everything. It's kind of interesting, but it's not available in this version. It is in the classic version though, if you did want to check it out. And then Legends lets you read through like all the history and stuff that just got generated. We're gonna play Fortress. <laughs> and then it simulates a couple weeks just to get things rolling. There is an inbuilt tutorial. It does not cover everything. In fact, it doesn't cover very much at all. It covers the basics. Um, if you only only do the tutorial, you will die because there's not enough. It doesn't tell you enough on its own to uh, actually make you self-sustaining. So we're going to skip the tutorial anyway. It is fine though. It's just warning us about if it's our first time and stuff. So here we are on our world map. We can scroll around it with W, A, S, and D. We can also use the middle mouse button, click to down and dragging to move it around, which is a very fancy new feature that was not in the original game. So we have to find a place to start. You can see as I'm scrolling around on the screen, oh, I have to move my head. As I cursor around on the screen up in the top right corner, it's saying what is in this area. But this isn't the full size of the map. You might be thinking, oh, this is a pretty reasonably sized map. It doesn't seem that huge. Um, this is zoomed out. <laughs> this is kind of more the real scale. This is like one tile on the main map. As you can see, it gets a lot closer in every single one of these. It's kind of hard to see because it's actually a nice pretty tile set now compared to how it used to be. Like each one of these is a tile and each one has a different uh, set of circumstances, right? Anyway, let's zoom back out. We can just right click to do that. Let's find an embark location because we don't want to search for things manually. We'll be here forever. What we want in our embark location some of this stuff we're not even going to mess with. X and Y dimensions. Remember how I said you could change those? I think this is only the search radius, though. This isn't going to set your embark size. But I'm going to set this to 3 and 3 instead of 4 and 4. Because the way it works is if it's a 4 by 4 and you have things set for filters, right? Any of those tiles that have some of these requirements and then tiles maybe on the other side of the 4x4 four four have some of the other requirements, it'll count that area as being acceptable, right? So if we make it really small, 3x3 three three or even smaller, then we're guaranteeing that the tiles we have selected have all the things we want, right? <laughs> it's a little hard to explain, but I'd recommend changing it to 3x3 three three just so you know your everything you're looking for is closer together. Savagery is like how violent the area is. Oh, they've actually changed this. This is nice. 
we might actually make use of this. This used to just be like very savage, medium, and low, which didn't really explain anything. So savagery is like how dangerous the just the wilderness is, the area around you. It doesn't really affect like goblin invasions or anything like that or mythical beasts. But like calm means there's basically nothing. It's just you might see like very small animals around. Wilderness means you can have some bigger animals like wolves and grizzly bears and things like that. Oh my. Untamed wilds means you're going to run into um, mythological creatures almost. You'll find a lot of animal men creatures but you know as a furry that seems like a good thing but no it's actually a pretty bad thing untamed wilds are incredibly dangerous because those creatures are very deadly kind of surprising that there's not more here because there is there is more savage areas maybe they didn't generate on this world we're going to do wilderness because we want to make sure we have enough uh, animals to hunt so i don't really want calm and untamed wilds is a little bit insane we're no, not concerned about spirit that's fine the way it is I'm not concerned about the elevation temperature we're a little bit concerned of but i don't run it i don't want to put it on a filter because we can, we can work around uh, temperature. Same for rain, same for drainage. We don't care. <laughs> aquifers. We'll go back to aquifers in a minute. We do want a river. Any river will do. Soil. Now, one thing I don't know for sure is if uh, <laughs> the dev has a proper understanding of greater than or less than. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. I would read this as soil is less than or equal to deep. So as long as there's any soil, it, that should go off. But just in case, I'm also going to turn sand and clay on. Sand, of course, can be used for glass. Clay can be used for making pots and stuff. The main reason we want any of these, literally any of them, <laughs> is fine. Um, we just want th this stuff to exist so that we can plant crops. If you don't have sand, clay, or soil, you just have rock, you can't plant crops. Unless you do some really complicated stuff, which maybe we'll eventually cover. But I'd rather not cover it because it's doing it the hard way. And then they've added a way to search for specific metals. But I'm not going to worry about any of this. Um, any metal will probably do fine for us. Iron is probably the best one to pick in this list. What would be really nice to have in this list is some kind of coal, because there is coal in the game, and that would help us out quite a bit. Aquifers. Aquifers, you might know what they are in real life. They're big underwater storages of water. They will get in the way of building the base the way you want. You might accidentally tunnel into one and flood your base. They're kind of a pain. So I want no heavy aquifer. I don't think I care if there's a light aquifer or not, though. We might be able to work around a light one. And they're, in the classic game, these were not separated. <laughs> so let's begin searching. So it'll scan through the map. All the yellow areas are areas that like partially meet the conditions. The ones that aren't marked at all are ones that don't meet the conditions at all. And the green areas are ones that meet the conditions. We are looking for green areas in forests. So we got one there, a couple there. It's usually around the bases of mountains where you find all this stuff. And then there's other places that have all the stuff, but are also just kind of hell holes that we don't really want to live in. <laughs> all right. Matches are found. We're going to press escape to get this menu out of the way. And you'll see it still has the green area selected. So, yeah, we don't want hills. These are hills up here and mountains. Uh, we don't want flatlands. There's no trees to cut down. Shrublands, not really. We might be able to make them work. Wasteland, definitely not. Badlands, definitely not. I think it's getting hotter and hotter down here, though. The way the maps generate, sometimes you get a both the North and South Pole. But in this case, we have a, a North Pole and an Equator. So it's like not it's not like the entire world is generated here. Or you could think of it as a tidally locked world turned sideways. But anyway, we have a dry broadleaf forest here. Temperature is warm. It has a stream. There's two types of rivers. There's streams and brooks. Streams are bigger, which are, which is a good thing because we want them to be able to make our wells later in the game. But yeah, it's warm, heavily forested, thick vegetation. That's for like bushes and stuff. The surroundings are wilderness, which we want. It has a fluxstone layer. Oh, I don't know if I turned on the fluxstone layer in the search. Fluxstone, you definitely want to turn that on in your in your find results. Fluxstone is used to make uh, steel. All right. And then our neighbors are elves and goblins. The elves are peaceful. The goblins are hostile, which also change our origin civilization to pick where our dwarves come from. So as we scroll through these guys, it'll show us where they live in blue. So these guys are pretty close. We might want to come from the banners of covering. Generally, I like to just come from somewhere that's nearby. So we're going to do the banners of coloring. And then we are going to embark here. Just making sure it's the same tile. So we have a couple different places here that meet the requirements. We have this one, light aquifer. We have this one, no aquifer. We'll probably go for the one with no aquifer. Huh? So select embark. You can see... Now my selection is a four by four. Yeah, you can change it here, so you don't have to change it in the menu. Four by four is the recommended size. So you can see though how it's one tile taller and wider than the search. 
That's because we set the search to three by three and that allows us to do something like this where I'm like, I wanna grab more of the river. Confirm. Okay, so now we're gonna embark, but I might save this for the next episode because it's kind of a lot to go over here. So hope you all enjoyed this video. Like I said, these will be broken down into smaller videos that are more digestible. So I hope you enjoy those or this video. And until next time, hope you have a good day.